Welcome back to Restless the Podcast. This is episode four, and this will be the story of Joe, who will be our guest tonight. Joe is, uh, he is 62 years old. He is a father of four adult children. He has two daughters, one son, and an ad- adopted Chinese daughter. Uh, he loves technology, specifically sound engineering, which uh, we were pretty excited about, considering that's half our job is sound engineering. And uh, he also loves to go water skiing and and do boating. And Joe has quite the story that began around tw- uh, 2016 in the summer in which he suffered a near-fatal heart attack and started a long two-year process of recovery. Joe, we can't wait to hear your story and just the blessing that it will give so many other people who may have a similar story, particularly as they come face-to-face with death and where faith and life intersect and how you can just, in a tangible way, perhaps give other people who may be in similar situations or facing circumstances that are very challenging some hope and inspiration. So, Joe, tell us your story. Just take us by the hand and lead us all into it. Okay, sounds good. Um, so my story actually begins in January of 2015 when um, uh, I joined, or as a family, we joined a boat club. And this boat club is basically a timeshare for boats. So instead of owning your own boat, um, you own a fleet of boats. So people would ask me if I own a boat. I'd say, no, I have a fleet of boats. Now what you do is you sign one out um, each weekend um, as available. Uh, But then one big feature that helped sell me on the the boat club was the fact that you get a five-day continuous trip um, every summer. And so, and they have boats up to 28 feet. So um, that would, um, uh, that was big enough for our family. So in fact, in the summer of 2015, we took a a boat trip down the Chesapeake Bay to um, four, no, five ports of call, uh, Solomon's Island, uh, Tangier Island, Chrisfield, and Tillman Island. And then stopping in to see a friend on Kent Island and then back home. It was a great trip. Everybody enjoyed it, except for my son, who actually got sick during the trip. But everybody enjoyed it. But they weren't really up for it in the summer of 2016. So I said, okay, I will, I'll take a solo boat trip. I'll just go north of the Bay Bridge this time, short jaunts, 40 to 60 minutes, um, um, an hour or two hours, whatever. And so I had this plan for July 11th, 2016. So uh, on July 9th, I was I had water skied. I had taken three runs, and I was getting up for my fourth fourth run, and I felt a terrible twinge of pain in my back. Um, it was my sciatic nerve, and if anybody's ever had a sciatic nerve problem, it it shoots down your your leg, and so I was in a lot of pain. So um, they pulled me out of the water. Um, uh, a friend helped me get my jet ski out, and I was able to just climb into the SUV and drive the jet ski home and get my son to unhook it and all that kind of stuff. And then for the next few days, I was just um, hanging on. I had to cancel my boat trip. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm at the chiropractor. Well, Wednesday afternoon, about 3.30, I was laying on his table and I started feeling a pain in both arms and in my chest a little bit. And I'd never felt that before. And um, uh, I had had a stent in 2005 uh, for a blockage. But in any case, I was I was just doing fine. And um, so this pain gets stronger. And I thought, this is a really strange pain I've never felt before. And at that point, you're in de- denial. You're just like, this really isn't happening to me. So now it's getting a little worse. And the chiropractor says, do you want an ambulance? And I, I'm thinking to myself, no, I don't want to spend $500 to find out I have indigestion and go, you know, and be embarrassed at the emergency room. So um, I go um, and I'm calling my wife saying, oh, we should just go to the emergency room, you know, drive me up uh, to double check. And uh, as soon as I hung up the phone from her, the pain was unbearable. I was on the floor um, and they call it the elephant on your chest, uh, the proverbial ele- elephant on your chest. And it, um, it was a tightness that I'd never experienced. So they got me in the ambulance um, and at, uh, gosh, probably around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, they wheeled me through the um, double doors at uh, Carroll Hospital Center. And um, the next thing I knew, it was Thursday morning. 
and I had a tube mm. down my throat. Mm. Uh, so um, basically what happened was I, um, I had, uh, the stent had reclogged to 100%. Uh, in what's called the left anterior descending artery, the LAD, also known as the Widowmaker, and um, and so um, uh, so now I wake up and I find out I've had a heart attack. But let's back up um, 16 hours. So for Julie, the experience is she's following the ambulance. She gets to Carroll Hospital Center and they tell her it's serious and. So, and she's thinking, uh, this is going to be embarrassing, you know, he's going to be fine uh, when it's just indigestion. So now she's starting to, you know, go through an evolution of thought, you know, um, and uh, they come out and tell her that it's very serious. And, um, and then it starts to hit her that um, uh, because of the words they were using, she could be a widow. And so now... Um, uh, the, we have a family text, and everybody's texting, and she's trying to find out information. And what they're telling her is that I'm very sick, and the next 48 hours are critical. And what had happened that we found out later was um, they um, they weren't aware. Well, I told the ambulance driver, but they weren't aware of my sciatic nerve uh, pain. So when they jammed me down on the table, uh, they said that I turned into the Incredible Hulk and you know, uh, jumped up and ripped the intubation tube out. And, um, and in the process, I th um, threw up and I aspirated um, vomit. Um, later on, that caused pneumonia. But in any case, um, so they're coming out and telling her um, um, that, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's 48 hours is critical. So she's thinking, now, what does she tell the kids when she gets home? And at that point, we have a, a very dear friend named Steve, who's also a doctor. And he calls her and he says, boy, it sure is a good thing Joe wasn't on that boat this afternoon. And so, um, and at that point, it hit her that um, um, what she was going to tell the kids was, God is not done with your father yet. He otherwise, he would have been on the boat and he wouldn't be here anymore. So um, she went home and... Um, we have a living room, dining room area that connects. So they all had like a camp out. Uh, later on, I found out um, I, was, I was relating this story to Steve when we were with him on Labor Day this past year and how God had used his words. And, uh, and at that point, Jordan, my son, shared a, um, a thought that, um, um, uh, that Julie um, was so sure that nothing was going to happen that she was going to leave her cell phone upstairs charging. And Jordan was like, well, mom, in case they do call, you really need to have your cell phone with you. So anyway, um, so Thursday I wake up and there's a lot of people around. And, um, and then that's when it really got tough. Um, what I found out was that um, uh, the, again, the LAD had clogged completely and damaged my heart. And... Um, Basically, there's a, a thing called an ejection fraction that measures a heart's health. Normal is 60, and basically it is 60% of the time it's pumping, 40% relaxing. Mine was down to 21, um, and it never came back. Hmm. Uh, another thing that happened was the pulmonologist walked in, and he said, um, he said uh, well, I was praying for you, and... Uh, I said, well, did I come close to the edge? He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, did you see the light? And I said, well, I didn't see any lights. I mean, I didn't have any recollection. I mean, I was like I was asleep from Wednesday at 4 till Thursday morning. So anyway, um, that began. Uh, I, I was there for eight days. Uh, what happened then was I developed a, um, they called it an I ICU trauma. Um, it's kind of like a, a low, low end form of PTSD. And what I found was every time I started to fall asleep, I had this sudden anxiety uh, that I couldn't breathe. I could breathe, but it, you know, when you start to drift off to sleep, generally speaking, you don't think about it. You know, all your life you fall asleep. Mm. I would get there and then I would just have this anxiety. And um, so anyway, um, I had trouble sleeping. Um, I came home from the hospital 
and I was having terrible a terrible time uh, sleeping, um, and um, and eating and breathing, um, stomach problems. Um, so anyway, um, so those next few weeks were really tough. Um, I probably didn't sleep more than two hours a night for four weeks. So we got to um, mid-August, and we had planned just a very short family vacation at my sister-in-law's beach house in New Jersey. And I was, I was just okay. They had given me codeine at that point for this um, lung problem. And basically, I could feel that there was something in there, but I wasn't able to cough it up. And so um, I went, and the first night had a rough night. The second morning, I woke up, and um, I couldn't breathe. So they had to take me to the local um, uh, medical center, and I ended up staying there for a week. Um, and um, so anyway, at that point, it turned out that I had a fluid, uh, you know, a liter of fluid in each lung cavity. Mm. And um, so they worked on that. And then because I had been on blood thinners because of the heart attack and some other things, um, they wouldn't do what's called a thoracentesis. And that's where they stick a needle in the back of your ribs and they draw the fluid out. So, um, I, you know, I was there. Um, they used Lasix to get, out, get the fluid out. And then I, I was able to go home and they gave me, and then I was on oxygen. I had an oxygen machine and an oxygen tank. And um, so we got home, and um, uh, it was just a rough time. So um, at the beginning of, um, oh, and then during this time in uh, the New Jersey hospital, probably Tuesday of that second week, um, the cardiologist, the house cardiologist came in and, and if you guys recall, the summer of 2016 was a very hot summer. It was like 100 degrees. So he was talking matter-of-factly. I mean, like he would talk about the weather. He was like, yeah. And then, then all of a sudden he blurts out with no warning, oh, you'll probably need a heart transplant. Mm. So, um, so at that point, I was terrified. Um, I, could, I couldn't even tell people without getting choked up. I, you know, the thought of having open-heart surgery just terrified me. Um, so anyway, we got home, and then I saw my own cardiologist, and he was a little more gentle about it. He goes, um, um, you know, we can look at that. Um, you know, that might be a possibility that we have to look at. So it's more gentle words. And then there's also this thing called an LVAD, a left ventricular assistance device. Basically, it's a pump that looks like a, a car's water pump that... Um, the big end gets sewn into your left ventricle, and then there's a white tube that goes up to your aorta outside of the aortic valve, and that's important because um, at that point, um, it is continuously pumping blood. Um, so people with LVADs have, a, um, have very faint blood pressure, there's, or very faint pulse, sorry. Hmm. So this is like a... Um... Like a, a rotating centrifugal pump. Yes, a rotating c centrifugal pump. Um, um, I think I showed you guys at the dinner, but I actually happened to have it with me because I was having lunch with a friend I hadn't seen in a while. Hmm. Oh my gosh! Oh look wow! At that. He, <laughs> yeah, Joe has just—he's got he, it with him. He just pulled the pump out of his pocket. Yeah. And where was this located? In my heart. Oh, my goodness. And um, I have pictures, but basically, for purposes of a podcast, to describe it, um, it, looks like a, um, it looks like a candle holder with about a two-inch base and a five-eighths inch tube coming out of it. And that tube literally gets sewn into your left ventricle. Um, and it's a pump that will run anywhere from say 1500 to 9000 rpms my set rate was about 2540 rpms and um so this was pumping 90% of the uh blood in my body so as a result uh, a couple of things had to happen actually i'm getting a little ahead of myself but 
anyway, we I heard about this thing called an LVAD. So then um, um, my doctor says, um, I have an associate or I have a colleague down at University of Maryland. Um, and so I was able to get an appointment like within two days. Mm. And a, a uh, Dr. Van Quay Tan, um, a wonderful woman who's a PhD and MD and professor at the medical school in cardiology, um, mm-hmm. met with me and she was just very um, caring and basically was, we hope for the best, but we need to start planning. So um, when you get any kind of a transplant, you need to be approved into the program. Um, so um, they do an extensive amount of um they take an extensive amount of actions for example you go down for a whole day and you have some tests you meet with the surgeon you meet with a social worker you meet with a psychiatrist because they want to know are you the type of person that's going to follow instructions do you have a good support system and are you going to take care of yourself Mm -hmm. so you get approved into the transplant program so i went through that um and uh, in December of 2016, I was approved into the transplant program. Backing up just a little, um, uh, in October, a couple of things happened. Um, I had gone to church, and it was about 11.30, and I felt fine. Then a few minutes later, my lungs started hurting. Each breath felt really painful. So then it went away a little. So I go home. We were going to a wedding down on Kent Island, about an hour and 15-minute drive uh, from where we live. Uh, and our daughter was maid of honor in a wedding, so I really wanted to be there. So I got in the car, and I remember thinking I should tell, tell my wife how I'm feeling, but I didn't. So it just got worse and worse. And um, by the time we got down to 10 minutes from the wedding, I said, we need to make a choice here. Um, we either need to turn around and go home or... Um, uh, or, I mean, I'll just sit somewhere in a room during the wedding. Um, as it turned out, there was a place I could sit away from everybody else and watch my daughter. So we made it through the wedding, um, and then Julie drove me home. And then what was worse was the oxygen tank I had didn't really last that long. So taking really taking normal breaths was excruciating. There is a lining on your lungs lungs called the pleura. Mm. And um, it's like a saran wrap. And when it becomes inflamed, every breath is extru- excruciating. So anyway, um, I, I would, you know, use my oxygen and then wait a minute or two and take light breaths and then do it. So we got home and she took me up to Carroll Hospital Center again. And I ended up being in there for four days. And they, they called it pleurisy because they couldn't find anything else um, but that's a general term. And um, so, um, again, I was in the hospital. Um, in the first two hours, they gave me morphine and um, two strong antibiotics, and that took the edge off the pain very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, anyway, so I was in there, for, and then I came out. Another thing that happened uh, was that um, I, um, I, I had— uh, because of now where I was like three months into having had the heart attack, um, I, I said to my wife, you know, um, and when I go in the hospital, they keep asking me, do I have an advanced directive and all that kind of stuff? And I said, I, I've decided that I don't want to be revived. Um, I don't want to go through this again. Um, and she was okay with that. And so um, I, uh, I told my oldest daughter and her husband um, I'm sorry, I guess he, they weren't married yet, right? Mm-hmm. Um, her, and her fiancé. And the next day, Tim, my son-in-law, called me and said, hey, Joe, um, I'd like you to really think about that and just do one thing for me. Um, um, you're a fighter, and so I'd like you to talk to Dr. Steve about, about that decision. I said, okay, I'll do that. And um, so I did talk to Steve, and he pointed out that there are levels of advanced directives, like if— you're brain dead for seven days. So I modified what I was going to do, but it was pretty interesting. And then I have another really dear friend, and um, we would get together um, 
by the way, a lot of my friends I hadn't seen in years came out of the woodwork and they just couldn't do enough for me. They, they wanted to come visit. And when, every time they came, it was like, what can I bring you? It was wonderful. So my one friend said, you know, I just love your indomitable spirit. And I said, well, that's a term we use in Taekwondo. That's one of the values of Taekwondo. And, um, so that was encouraging. Um, so, um, I, I just, um, just really kept that in mind and, um, kept that before the Lord. And also I remember thinking in September of 2016, this is going to be at least an 18 month journey. I just had that sense. And, um, so anyway, um, so now we get to, um, we get to, uh, December, January, and now it's cold. And I was, um, I was, uh, in the cold, breathing really hurt. Uh, it wasn't like the pleurisy before, but it deep breaths hurt in the cold. So, uh, and on top of that, um, I just, I was, I was getting weaker. Um, and, uh, so, uh, I remember early February of 2017, it was a 70 degree day. And, um, I like, I also like college lacrosse. So I went down to my alma mater, Johns Hopkins for a lacrosse game. And because I had to be late, I had to park in this other parking lot, and it required going up steps that go 75 feet in elevation. And I was just sucking wind. When I told my cardiologist that, he said, please, get a handicap pass. But, and I had resisted that. So anyway, um, that was a little bit of an eye-opener. So um, uh, now we're in February, and um, oh, so now our daughter, our oldest daughter, Natalie, is um, looking at an April 8th wedding. Also, throughout the fall of 2017, I was thinking, I just want to make it to both daughters' weddings and, and be healthy and, and comfortable. Um, and in fact, our second daughter got engaged in March of 2017, but we knew that was coming. So April 8th, we had this wedding, um, and um, on March 31st, I went down to the University of Maryland for a routine right heart cath. And Dr. Tan, the September before, had said, uh, your left heart is very weak and your right heart is compensating for it. And that won't last forever. So um, uh, when you get a right heart catheterization, they give you happy juice. The happy juice is a combination of Versed and fentanyl. Mm. And basically, you, you are just even, you're totally unaware of, how it's affecting you. You kind of nod off your, you know, it's a twilight drug. Mm. And, um, you, you know, obviously uh, it's being um, abused these days, but uh, used in a medical situation, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. So um, I, uh, I came out of the right heart calf and um, I'm out in the hall and I see Dr. Tan. She goes, I'm going to talk to you and your wife upstairs. And I didn't really give it a second thought. I was probably still on the happy juice a little bit. And um, so we get upstairs, and she said, "Wow, you remember last September I told you that uh, your right heart was compensating and that wouldn't last forever. Well, we've reached that point. You now need LVAD surgery as soon as possible. And, um, and by the way, you also need a PIC line. That's a peripherally inserted central catheter. What they do is they go in through your left arm. They send a catheter all the way to the entrance to your heart. And then they give you a little pump, and they pump an anisotropic drug. Mm. One, favorite one is milrinone, and that's a muscle contracting drug. A drug. So that is not a long-term solution. That is a, a temporary bridge to needing a repair. Mm. So, um, so this was a Friday, and the PIC team um, doesn't. Uh, this was late Friday afternoon. Oh, she said, "By the way, I can get you a bed, and so I'm admitting you." And so, um, so the pick team doesn't work on weekends, so I had to wait till Monday. So that Sunday, I, um, I had Julie bring down Richard Cheney's book called Heart. And I had read half of it, which is something I do often read a half a book and then don't finish it, in the fall. And um, so I picked it up and I started reading and I did something I never did before and maybe will never do again. I read 133 pages of nonfiction. And... Um, and basically, I was walking in Richard Cheney's footsteps. He had had um, a couple of heart attacks, and then um, 
They put him on a Milrinone pick line pump. Then he got an LVAD, and then he got a transplant. So anyway, um, so uh, Dr. Tan says, hey, I'm going to be out of town next week. Here is my cell phone number in case anything serious happens. Call me after your daughter's wedding. So two days after Natalie's wedding, I called her, and it was about noon. And I said, um, hey, I've got like four or five family things in May and June. And uh, so can this surgery wait until June? She goes, you can make that choice, but you need to understand that if you go into organ failure, there's nothing we can do for you. And I said, oh, okay. Well, you got anything in the next two weeks? And um, so um, she had to go before the committee at 4 o'clock anyway, so she called back at 5.30 and said, we can do next Tuesday a week. Wow. So uh, she said, what do you think? And I said, uh, yes. I, I you know, had no anxiety about it. I immediately said yes. I said, one caveat, let me just sleep on it, but I am 99% sure I need to talk to my wife and let her know. Um, and that was fine. And um, so, again, not an ounce of anxiety about the surgery. I was more concerned about some business things I needed to take care of. I hadn't done our taxes, so I had to get that done. And so, but I finished up all the, the crucial things at work and personal business in three days. So I was good. So um, uh, the surgery was at, uh, say, I don't know, 7.30 that morning or 8 o'clock, I can't remember. And Julie asked, do you want me to come down in the morning? I said, no, it's going to be a long day. I don't need you to hold my hand just for two minutes before surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I wasn't sure if I was going to be anxious or not. Um, was I going to, you know, really lose it, you know? Um, but I, I, I just had an excitement. I was, um, I, I, in fact, when they, uh, the surgeon come over, comes over and introduces himself and then they will you into the operating room, I was more fascinated with the operating room than I was anything else. Um, I mean, it's... It's a bright room with super fluorescent lights and like, you know, five carts that are covered, you know, presumably with things they don't want you to see, like saws and stuff. But um, um, so, I, you know, I was fine. And then, you know, all they do is they get a line into your artery and your wrist so they can measure your blood pressure very carefully mm -hmm. while they're sedating you. As soon as they got that in, the anesthesiologist said, hey, I'm going to put you to sleep now. He did. So I woke up. Um, that time, they actually left the tube in. That was a bummer. Um, like the heart attack, they had left the um, intubation tube mm. in. Waking up with an intubation tube is just really tough uh, for two reasons. It's, it's uncomfortable, but also you are like dry as a desert. Mm. Um, for the first five hours after getting an intubation tube out, ice water tastes like the most wonderful thing you've ever had. Um, so anyway, I... Um, I recovered from the LVAD surgery, and I had to learn how to use it. I you know, had a new piece of equipment that uh, was life-sustaining, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But then um, they also said, your, um, your, your left heart is now fixed by the LVAD, but your right heart, heart still has high blood pressure, so we need to bring that down with a vasodilator. A vasodilator is something that makes your, your veins and arteries widen to reduce pressure. You, know, you think about so much volume of liquid going through a pipe. Mm -hmm. If you make the pipe bigger, the pressure is lower. So, um, so they actually gave me sildenafil, which is the active ingredient in Viagra. So I called it my Viagra therapy. Um, and uh, so anyway, um, long about um, July, uh, that had done its thing, and I was really feeling a lot better. And at that point, a lot of people were saying to me, wow, you really look good. And I said, in what way do I look good? He said, well, you've got your color back and your energy. And I said, well, what did I look like before? And they said, you looked gray, you looked gaunt, you looked yellow, mm -hmm. you looked like you were dying. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, later on, um, after the heart transplant, I saw, um, I, I was getting ready and one of the nurses said to me, um, oh, we're real excited. Dr. Reyes from Carroll County is going to be doing catheterizations today, and, and we all love him. And so he walks in, and I recognize him. And I said, hey, I know you. And he goes, I know you. And he said, you look a lot better than you did the last time I saw you. And I said, well, how did I look? He goes, like you were dying. And so um, <laughs> um, he was a little bit of a character, and he was funny. So anyway, um, uh, so 
And I said to all of these people, thank you so much for telling me how bad, uh, for not telling me how badly I looked um, pr prior to that. So um, life returned to roughly normal at that point. There's a big caveat where there's a big limitation to an LVAD. You cannot immerse mm -hmm. um, because you have a power and data cable going through a sterile entry site in your ribs. And so, and then you wear a battery, two batteries and a controller on your belt. That means no showers, Joe? Well, you could have a shower, but they were limited because you had to have a dressing change every time you took a shower. So uh, each time the dressing was changed, there was a small bandage called Tagaderm. It's a, a very clear, it's made by 3M Company who makes film, which probably nobody knows what it is anymore. But um, it's a clear, very sticky bandage. And so that was over the wound. And then for showers, I had to do like a uh, 9 by 12 bandage over that mm. to keep the water out. I had to transfer the two batteries and the controller from the belt to a shower bag that was water resistant not waterproof, and then I would carry that into the shower. I would set it on the shower shelf. I would clip it so it couldn't fall because you could not have this thing tugged, although they did anchor it with a, um, with a catheter anchor, so something that sticks to your skin and has a plastic locking uh, mechanism on it. Um, so anyway, I had to take showers that way, and I could take on average two, hours, uh, two showers per week. And after each shower, Julie had this kit that was, she went fully sterile. She um, put on a cap, a um, paper gown, and there were two sets of gloves. Um, the first set of gloves she used to take the old dressing off, and then she would sterilize this area. Then she would take those gloves off, put the new gloves on, put the new dressing on, and, um, and then um, put the final bandage on it. And um, so, um, oh, and we wore masks, uh, you know, it was very, a very serious thing that you have basically an open wound that you're walking around. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you have a cable going up to your heart. So any bacteria that would get in there, it could run right up the, mm. the cable to your heart. And, you know, you know people that have had sepsis or even died of sepsis. So very serious. So anyway, obviously, I, I, and I knew as soon as the LVAD surgery was necessary, the, the summer of 2017 was lost for swimming. And I just, my prayer was, Lord, just give me 2018. And um, so anyway, um, I got stronger. Um, I started doing a lot of normal things except for swimming throughout the fall. And then um, uh, there are four lists for heart transplants, 7, 2, 1B, and 1A in um, increasing order of priority. So seven is inactive, two is low, one, a, one B is medium, and one A is high. LVADs, um, like this one is uh, very reliable and a lot smaller, but they weren't like that even 10 years ago. So there's a leftover um, practice which says, oh, I'm sorry, and as soon as you get an LVAD, you're on list one B. But there's a practice that says you can elect a 30-day window to list 1A. So um, um, I was, you know, thinking I'll wait and build up some time. And then, um, so anyway, in December, I went for a pulmonary test. And I did not know that Dr. Tan was going to be there, so she was there overseeing it. So I asked her about list 1A. She goes, well, this is a great time of year, uh, unfortunately, because people drink and drive. Mm. So I said, okay, well, let's, let's go ahead and do it. And she goes, we well, have to uh, update an antibody test. And that took a couple of weeks. And then on December 19th, she sent me an email saying, um, uh, you're, you're now on list 1A. So, um, so then um, I, um, I went to a New Year's Eve party and I came home. And the medevac helicopters always fly right over our house. So mm -hmm. I heard one go over at 12.30, and I was thinking, you know, is, is this a possibility? Uh, then the next day, about 1 o'clock, um, my wife is on a, a text chain, a, the prayer text chain at church, and a former member of our church, a woman, 36, 
Um, they had left our church, but she um, she had gotten back into drugs that she had previously had a problem with. And she was at University of Maryland with liver failure. Mm-hmm. And they were saying she they have a liver for her. They have to find recipients for the rest of the organs. So the women on the prayer chain were speculating, is this heart for Joe? So anyway, um, at 5.30, I'd sat down to watch the first semifinal college football game. And the phone rang, and uh, I looked down. I thought, that is a University of Maryland phone number. Mm. And, um, and so I picked up, and it was um, – the voice on the other end was, this is Andrea, your transplant coordinator. We have a donor heart identified for you. Surgery is at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And when can you be here? Wow. And that's 5.30. So I said, I'll be there a little after 7. So um, I um, – I got started getting, I, I kind of had a plan and a list. So um, my big thing is when I'm in the hospital, I have my electronics and my chargers and stuff like that. So I had all that together. And um, so uh, we go down and um, at this point, and now they're, you know, they're prepping you, they're shaving your chest and stuff like that. And they're apologizing. Later on, they're apologizing for keeping me up late. And I was like, hey, I'm going to be asleep for two days. So I don't care. Um, Mm. unfortunately at eight o'clock that night, we did find out that she had passed away. That was the same girl. Yeah. Yeah. Was Uh, that the heart? That that was not the heart. Mm. Um, uh, because she died of cardiac, cardiac arrest. Plus Mm -hmm. it could not have been her because she was still alive and they wouldn't have identified her. Um, so anyway, um, so, um, once again, I said, Julie, come down, you know, after the traffic, uh, I'll be fine in the morning again. Not an ounce of anxiety, not a second of anxiety. So, uh, again, the surgeon introduces himself. They wheel me in. And uh, this time I, um, I knew what I wanted to say. I, um, you know, I, uh, well, I looked around. I tried to look around as much as I po- possibly could at the, the operating room because, again, I was so fascinated. And then when the anesthesiologist said to me, uh, okay, I'm going to put you to sleep now, I said, I'll see you on the other side. And um, so, anyway, um, so, uh, sure enough, I woke up Wednesday afternoon about three o'clock and, um, just really tired. Just, re- I, my, my eyelids just could not stay open. So I would, I said, what day is it? And a voice over here is saying it's Wednesday. And then, um, so I'd ask that question again and again. And, um, then I'd go to sleep, which for what seemed like several hours mm-hmm. and I'd look up and seven minutes had passed. So um, anyway, um, eventually I came out of it. That voiceover ended up being over there, ended up being my wife, but I was just out of it. Um, and then, um, then I started recovering pretty quickly. Um, the worst um, day after the surgery was not the few days afterwards. It was the Monday when I woke up with a migraine that led to nausea, severe nausea. Um, so anyway... Um, the other thing is that um, uh, the the meds they give you, immunosuppressants, um, actually a lot of meds have the effect of messing up your stomach. So anyway, um, and I would say that was really the worst part of it. Uh, and going back to my original reaction of being terrified of the surgery, it was a the the transplant surgery was easier than the LVAD surgery because the LVAD surgery they don't cut your sternum all the way. Hmm. They put a little, a little slit here and bend your ribs to get that thing in there. Well, when you bend muscles and ligaments, that hurts a lot more than this. And um, so anyway, um, so like two or three days after um, transplant surgery, I was, um, I was able to cough and it didn't hurt that much. And I'm like telling the nurses, hey, I may be able to cough. And they said, well, Mr. Tear, you're supposed to be holding that pillow against your chest when you cough. But in any case, um, after LVAD surgery, coughing and sneezes were excruciating. Mm. And that was what led to my original, you know, fear of it. Mm. But all in all, it wasn't that bad. Um, so I, I got out of the hospital in 12 days after transplant surgery and um, just started recovering. And uh, by April or May, sternum is really healed up and Aside from stomach problems, um, life really turned returned back to normal, and um, and so I was able to swim during the summer. Um, oh, 
those first few showers were heavenly, um, you know, unencumbered showers. Getting in the hot tub was heavenly. And, um, and then in the fall, I got even stronger. I, I was able to start doing my original household chores that I had, hadn't done for two years. Like I swapped out a, heart, a hot tub pump that weighed 40 pounds and um, put in a new garage door opener, um, drove, uh, took a trip, uh, actually took five weekend vacations um, from Labor Day through mid October, including um, another boat trip. Mm. And, um, and then in beginning of December, I went down and pulled a U-Haul trailer back with my son's stuff in it. Okay, so as I approached my anniversary for the heart transplant uh, in November, a dear brother of mine that I've known for um, almost 50 years um, encouraged me to to write down thoughts, lessons learned, and things like that. So my January 2nd post on Facebook sounded like this. A year ago at this very minute, with no anxiety or fear, I looked up at the anesthesiologist, grinned, and said, see you on the other side. And I knew that I was in the Lord's hands. 31 hours later, I woke up with a new heart. The U.S. national average survival rate in the first year of a heart transplant is about 88% or one chance in eight of not surviving. For University of Maryland, it is 96%. So that's a one in 25 chance of not surviving. Well, I'm still here. I received a card with a heart saying happy anniversary uh, in the mail a couple days after Christmas. And as I was opening the card, I thought it was a Christmas card. And then I looked at it and it was um, a heart anniversary card signed with uh, short notes by the University of Maryland Transplant, and VAD, surgeons, doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, and coordinators. It was great. Um, Thank you, UMMC folks. You are the best. Um, uh, Many folks have asked me about lessons learned, aha moments, what's different, uh, and there's just way too many to list here. But the two biggest changes for me are these. The first thing is that I no longer anticipate pain and suffering. Mm. Uh, I know that it is easier said than done, but here is my logic. All of the pre-anxiety is wasted time and energy. 95% of the medical treatments since 2016 went fine with little or no discomfort or pain. Actually, this extends way beyond medical treatments to most of life for me now. Don't sweat the small stuff. That said, I do have an inverse bucket list of medical procedures that I would not like to repeat. Um, And they are... Um, uh, intubation, NG tubes, defibrillation, and thoracentesis. And the second thing is, um, if you think about the ups and downs of daily life, everyone has an emotional slash mental mean, lower, low water state. That's M-L-L-W. That's a navigation term. If you're a boater, then you use charts so that you don't um, go into too shallow water and um, ruin your boat. And so basically, MLLW is the minimum depth that you'll face when traversing a body of water like a lake or river or the ocean. And if you ignore these indicators, you may take out the lower unit and the propeller on your boat or worse. So my emotional mental MLLW is one heck of a lot higher than it was prior to 7, 13, 16. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, previously, every day started off just average or, or sometimes underwater. Now, every day now starts off great because feeling just okay means feeling great. Um, that is, I'm not in pain. I'm not worrying about not being here for my family. And I can do all the things that I couldn't do for a season and so much more. And so 2018 was an amazing year that erased the struggles of 2016 and 2017. And that was January. And now, uh, two months later, I'm even better. Um, one of the things that happens with a heart transplant is you come home on immunosuppressants. And there were two main immunosuppressants, tacrolimus and Celsept. Celsept is known for being hard on your stomach. Well, uh, as a result of a um, catheterization in January, um, they were able to uh, wean me down and then eventually off of Celsept and mm-hmm. replaced it with serolimus. Well, now I'm feeling even better than I did on that day. Mm-hmm. Um, 
no stomach problems, energy level incredible. Um, I, I really feel better than I did before the heart attack. And I think it's partially by contrast because of my perspective. Again, when I wake up in the morning and I've got 20 things that I want to attack and do, you know, my to-do list, um, it's, I'm just energized. I'm just full of life. And so that's my story. Joe, that's an incredible story. And as I listen to it, obviously we begin with this assumption that you are a follower of Christ. Yes. You have this relationship with the Lord, which I'm not sure your story with that, uh, when that began. Um, and maybe you could shed just a little bit of light on that. Yes. Um, I grew up um, with parents that didn't go to church, but they drove me to Sunday school every Sunday. Mm. They made me go to Sunday school. Mm -hmm. So I developed a, a church presence in my life, and I was in a Lutheran church that had a confirmation class. And so I went through the confirmation class, and on confirmation day, something changed. I became aware that Christ was personal. And so that's the day that I really say I came to Christ. And from that point forward, it's really just a matter of um, deepening my faith. First, it was through, um, in the early 70s, um, there was a thing called the Charismatic Renewal of the Holy Spirit, the Gifts of the Spirit. Um, that didn't, that, well, I was part of a church that there was some immaturity there. So that didn't really um, do it for me. Um, but then it became a part of young life. Mm. And that really is where mm. my faith took off. And then in college, I became a part of inner varsity. And my biblical understanding went very deep. Um, and from there, um, just uh, good churches, good sound churches, and um, um, spiritual friends, and um, a, um, uh, a wife who loves the Lord. Mm. But this experience brings you face to face, face to face with where the rubber of our faith meets the road. Yes, right? yes, yes. So we can talk about it all day long. Yeah. And we can go to church all day long, but now you have to come to the grips of the reality that, you know, tomorrow I may not wake up. That's right. That's right. Um, and you've hit the heart of the matter, pun intended. Um, uh, in, the, in those days and weeks after the heart attack, um, I remember thinking to myself, uh, prior to that, I thought uh, maybe cancer is going to be a part of my life in the future. And I remember, how will I respond? How will my faith work for me? And um, so I didn't know, but uh, the Lord was real. And what was really interesting to me was that suffering is suffering because it hurts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so God doesn't take the pain away, but he's there with you. Mm. And I remember in those sleepless nights, I was alone. Um, and um, so I just had this sense of God's presence and his being in control while the pain um, and struggle was there. You early on, the whole idea of this thing was fearful to you. Yes. Early on. And yeah. you said that. Yeah. But it seemed that as you told the story, this sense of anxiety from even when the LVAD was going to be installed and even at the transplant level that yeah. you, you were more interested in, in the equipment in the rooms. Oh, yeah. But knowing all along, in, in fact, you said at some point in time is that when it came to a directive... And, and here's where I see a shift is that maybe you shouldn't revive me. What were you thinking? Um, I, I just, I was worn out from three months mm. of struggle and um, I didn't necessarily see hope ahead. Um, but I did hold on to one thing. Um, and that was I wanted to be with my daughters at their wedding. I wanted to walk them down. The mm. And that was, that was what drove me that point. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but there was a point where I, I, I faltered. Because you were tired. I was tired. And did not feel that this was going to end up well. That, 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 well, yes. Um, I'm a very hopeful and positive person mm -hmm. in general. So I, I was hopeful, but I said, if I have another heart attack, uh, 
And if there is an option, I don't want to go. Th- I don't want to go through the last three months, July to October, again. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was hoping for the best, but I that was that was where I was. But there was, in regards to faith, there was this level level of, you know what? If it's my time, I'm confident that there will be another side. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact. Um, I mean, there was a point where it, I was in the middle. That that was more desirable than to live the way I was living. Um, but again, it was mitigated by the desire to be there for my children mm-hmm. um, and my wife too. And I I don't I'm not just throwing that in. I'm just saying that my wife has lived her life with me, and and if one of us goes to be with the Lord, we're content with that. But for my children, I wanted, you know to be there at their weddings especially and for grandchildren. Mm. That's, an, that's an incredible. So when the anxiety levels began to drop yeah. with these things, what was the direct cause of that? Um, let me think. That's a good question. Um, um, well, I guess maybe it was in 2017 when I knew I was going to make the first wedding and where I, I could tell I was going downhill, which meant that there was going to be a solution one way or another. Um, I knew that if I went downhill far enough, that LVAD surgery would be there. Um, you know, so I think that, um, I think it was really just the, the idea that a solution was on the horizon. I didn't know what it was, but, you know. At what place in this journey, Joe, did you feel... The absolute presence of the Lord? Um, I would say almost continuously. Continue. Yeah, um, especially uh, most powerfully in July, August, and September of 2016. Um, and uh, one of my mainstays was the um, uh, song Cornerstone by Hillsong. Mm. Um, there were just times where I had to listen to that over and over. And, 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 and uh, there are times if I listen to it, in my car, I start getting choked up because I, I'm taken back to that place of intimacy with the Lord. Hmm. That, that is uh, so incredible. Luke, what, what are you thinking about this whole thing? Um, did it feel pretty cool being a, technically a cyborg? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was. It was pretty cool. Um, and a lot of people kidded me about it, and it was just fun. We had a lot of laughs about it. And um, also, I, I just... Um, you know, I, I got to tell people about it and, and help people. Um, one of the things that has come out of this is that um, um, both the Carroll County rehab, Cardiac Rehab uh, folks and uh, Dr. Tan herself asked me to speak with LVAD and transplant patients. Uh, I spoke to a guy um, last summer, and when I first started talking to him, his voice was shaking. I thought, boy, this guy's kind of old. And then he goes, about halfway through, he goes, I'm sorry, I'm just so nervous about this. And I realized that he wasn't that, he was like my age. And um, so it's a real blessing um, to be able to, to encourage folks to something you've gone through and you know that you're going to get through it. And, and I, I mean, I would say I thrived through it. Um, but in any case, to be able to encourage them and say, you're going to be okay. And no, and, and, and I can only... Um, there's only a couple thousand people in the United States or maybe a couple, 20,000 who could say this. And there's not that many LVAD patients. There's not many transplant patients. I was impressed about your medical terms and how you remembered medications, statistics, um, the whole RPMs on the pump and things like that. But what do you say to, to folks, and you knew the statistics of survival, particularly at the, the Maryland system, But what do you say to people about eternity, though? Good question. Um, Well, what I did do with some of these people, I would say, can I pray with you? And they were appreciative to that. And so that's the opening that I Hmm. Um, Not people, and and I found that some people did have a faith. Um, um, They didn't ask me much more than that. Um, But, um, yeah. That's... That's interesting. And have you had the opportunity because of this to, as a doorway with other people, to say, hey, listen, 
there is incredible stats that you're going to pull through this, but maybe there's something else you need to know as well. No, I haven't had that opportunity yet. I I tread carefully yes. when I'm referred. Um, so, but I do do my leaders. You know, I just try to put things out there and, and see how they respond. Mm. If there is a message to both the follower of Christ out there who is going through any physical traumatic event in their lives that, much like yourself, you're going to be at this place where you're looking at the possibility of death. What do you say to them? Um, I say a bunch of things. I say, first of all, I understand your suffering. This is really tough. Um, this is, you know, um, tougher than, uh, it's, it's more suffering than I know of. Um, comparisons are never fair unless you are giving the gift to somebody of saying, boy, in your situation, I, I couldn't handle it. I went through my thing, but what you're feeling is tough. I remember there were like 10 people that I was praying for in those sleep nights that were suffering. And every one of them, I could say, honestly, I would not trade, trade places. So um, what I say is your suffering is there. And a lot of the people ended up being believers. So um, I you know, just say, I'm praying for you. Um, uh, and actually, I don't really bring up eternity because that would communicate mm. that you think they're not going to make it. Got it. A number of our guests in the past have talked about where other Christians, in trying to help, actually makes things worse. Oh, yeah. What are some of the do's and don'ts when you're in that situation? Um, I think... First of all, ask a lot of questions. How are you feeling about this? What do you think? Um, and then, um, and then you know, so you got that. You get them talking, get them talking about their fears, and then you address their fears rather than, well, and you address their fears without um, making promises that you can't keep or that, that are making statements that, may not be true about their future. Um, just say, I'm with you in this suffering right at this moment. I think that's the best thing you can do. Um, you've alluded to something that I've thought about a lot, and that is that a lot of people mean well, especially, say, at funerals. Um, and, you know, you just got to be there with the people and not try to come up with wisdom. Joe, you spoke to a profound topic in the Jewish faith. There's a thing called Shiva by which during the time of the morning, it was almost a duty by which friends and neighbors would go simply to be with them and keep their mouth shut. Yes. Because in reality, there's not so much, many profound things that you're going to say that make this any better. But for you, would you say, I just didn't want to be alone in this? That was exactly it. In fact, there were several times where I um, thanked people on Facebook. I said. You know, we live in a different world now. Um, I spent from July 13th through January 12th, July 13th of 2016, January 12th, 2018, I spent 48 nights in the hospital. And um, I said, you know what? I was never alone. And ideally, we should say that Christ keeps us from feeling alone. And, and that is true, but um, um, friends, family, believers are his hands and feet. Um, and presence. Um, and so I remember so many times I would um, post something, an update, and then I couldn't sleep. I'd wake up and um, there would be several encouraging words from people on Facebook. So I never, and especially New Jersey, um, my family had to leave a couple days after I went in the hospital. And then um, Julie came back a couple days later. But um, even then, I didn't feel totally alone. Mm. So um, that, uh, I think that's, that's the key thing. It's also, it's encouraging to hear that you were able to also find a, a good and encouraging use for social media. We had actually done a short, just a couple of days ago, warning of we think some of the dangers present in social media, but it is refreshing to hear you say that uh, there was some community there for you. In f yes. In fact, um, several years ago, my, five, five plus years ago, I made one 
political co- political comment on Facebook, and a friend kidded me about it. And I went apolitical from that point on. And so throughout my heart uh, issues, my goal was always just to tell a story about where I was, not whine, um, but just be honest, not, not sugarcoat it either. And um, it was interesting because I wasn't sure at first, am I sharing too much? I would go two days and people started emailing me like, what's happening? We miss your updates. I found that very encouraging. So I feel like I've found a very good use for social media because I don't engage in anything negative. Um, um, it's all positive And, um, yeah, I, I just um, I find it very useful for me. That's good. Good to hear that you can, you can use the upside of it. Yeah. Now, in your story, the spotlight has been on you. The collateral impacts that are the peripheral impacts for your family, them being around you, what do you think they take away from this? Um, let me think. I think, um, I think I've gotten, you know, glimpses of, of how it's affected them from time to time and the things that they say. And um, um, I think more than anything else, um, all four of my children are believers, and they have what I call their own homegrown faith. Mm. That is, they didn't just inherit it from their parents. They went out and found the the working faith for them. So I think that um, when I look in each of their eyes, in their um, countenance, I, I see a sense of, um, Dad, you got through it, and um, we respect you for that. Mm. Oh, and, I, and my son-in-laws, um, Tim and Tyler, they have spoke many an encouraging word. Um, like I said, it was Tim who said, Joe, you're a fighter. I, I, want, you to, um, you know, I want you to reconsider this and, and, and do this thing. Um, and so, yeah. So your story has been an incredible story. Uh, that bring together our faith and reality. And this is real stuff. Yes. And you had to face it down. And yet you've always been a guy, and we even see it right now in front of us, of just really optimistic and really powerfully hopeful. And it doesn't appear that during this whole time, maybe occasionally here and there, but that you never lost that, did you? No, no. I, I really didn't. Um, you know, it's... um. It's funny because um, I, there was another Facebook post where I said, well, you know, people ask me why I stay positive. And I said, well, I am generally have this um, orientation. But um, number one, I have a wife who's a saint, uh, I, my children, and, and some dear friends. Um, I reconnected with several friends as a result of this. But um, I'm talking about dear friends that go back to 1960 when I was three years old. And um, so that, um, and then even just the business acquaintances, um, you know, four or five levels deep of friendships, connections, so encouraging. Um, And then after all that, even my blood type participates. Mm -hmm. My blood type is B positive. I love it. Wow. It's it's in your DNA. Yeah, it's in my (laughs) DNA. Well, that that is so incredible, but... You know, the, one of the real struggles in our culture today is people facing less than hopeful attitudes about things and, and a great deal of anxiety issues that are going on. So Mental health cases through the roof. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. In fact, a guest that we have coming on in June is a, Sister Arlene is a psychotherapist who will be addressing some of those issues that are going on today, particularly in the X generation and millennials. What do you say? I mean, what do you say to to young people, to that young adults coming up right now about, of course, it's in your DNA, but how do you get to that state of optimism? Um, boy, um, what I would say to them, I guess, would be um, go out and understand somebody's hardships, understand suffering. Understand how good you have it. Um, and, and again, I think I said it earlier, um, by contrast, every 
literally every breath. There are times when I step back every day and I think, I take a deep breath and I think, I remember when every breath was excruciating. So by contrast to where I've been, the, the, the most minuscule aspects of life are pure joy. Do you have that's, that's wild? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It absolutely is. And you have so incredibly articulated that message throughout this. And we want to thank you so much for being a part of Restless the Podcast tonight. And would you consider from time to time checking in with us about how things are going for you and any other message that comes across? Sure. That, that you want to get out oh, there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Thank you so much, Joe. And now, before, before you go, though, that's something that reminded me of just every breath now is joy. Um, there's kind of a Hebrew legend uh, about God's original name, and we say Yahweh, but that's not actually the correct, correct pronunciation because in Hebrew uh, language, it translated to English, the letters are Y-H-V-H. Yes, but the reason that the Yahweh is not the right pronunciation is that the whole concept of God's name was beyond human tongue. But the closest sound to accurately portraying the name of God is the sound of breathing. And wow. someone once made the point, when a baby is born, what must it do to survive? Take its first breath or for the first time speak its first recital of God's name. And then when we die do we stop breathing or it's because we can no longer physically speak God's name that the body dies. And when you were saying that it used to be excruciating and during that time where people would have told you that you look dead, you look like you're dying. And then now that's easy and it feels great. And now you look like you're living. Yes. Yes. And I just, I got, that's the, that's what immediately passed through my head when you said that, that to, to just take a deep breath is pure joy. And when I think about a breath being pure joy, I just think about God's name I like in that. our lives. I like that. Amen. Joseph, Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for listening to episode four of Restless the Podcast. And uh, before I reveal the title, uh, we recorded a little extra piece of Joe that we wanted to add in that just fit absolutely perfectly. And so uh, I will let you listen to that now and uh, then finish with the standard closing. So just as I was going into surgery for the heart transplant, um, they told me that they're gonna, they were going to cool my body down to 89 degrees. And that's because they want to prevent any kind of organ damage and that slows your metabolism. So my son, being ever the jokester, said to me, you know, Dad, for a little time there, um, you were the most cold-blooded, heartless person I've ever met. And I said, yes, but I had a change of heart. And there's our title, Episode 4, Change of Heart. We here at Restless the Podcast are restless to find the one who said, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For whom is your heart restless? And for today, who can give you a change of heart? <laughs>